same way that um, not just the government, but the Reserve Bank and the regulators have all been on the same page when it comes to the new funding pools that have been set up for support to businesses for cash flow. Equally, uh, banks are being encouraged to lend. And I know anecdotally, I can say that it's been pretty strong through both our, um, you know, through anecdotally, through the residential um, mortgage market, as well as through business. So banks are keen to lend, I know we are. Um, and that was really one of the reasons that the government set up uh, some of those funding pools. So that means some of the, the small business loans are, uh, you know, 50% sort of underwritten by the government. And uh, and I think that that helps. So my quick answer to your question is, yes, I think everyone's on the same page. It's all about in, ensuring there's free flow of capital, that there's liquidity in the market. And I think those funding pools that have been set up that supplement bank lending will be a, a massive help. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other comments? Ivan, do you have any comments from a broker's point of view? Look, I'm probably going to elaborate more in regards to what banks are doing and no disrespect to uh, Benigo, but my comments will be more directed towards how the majors are behaving um, and what I'm dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm a commercial finance broker, someone who joined ANZ back in 74 and after 46 years, here I am. Um, you know, three redundancies and uh, two overqualified to get back into corporate lending. Um, but um, yeah, look, I've got some comments to make. I've got some real clients that, um, you know, need some commercial lines and um, I'll, I'll provide some more commentary around that. Um, All right. And yep. any other comments from anyone in the in the in the Zoom room? Tony, I noticed Gene Cropper asked David, "What industries are doing well at the moment? Are there any surprises?" Yes, uh, well, that's a good question. And so, um, you know, I think the industries uh, I touched on earlier that um, you know some of the service sectors and hospitality have really been struggling and, and clearly tourism is a real challenge. Uh, and I think there's going to be a bit of a rebalancing with, we're not going to have international tourism for a long time, but we will have domestic tourism. And if you look at last year, actually there were more Australians going overseas, spending their money than there were international tourists coming here. So because of how we get a slice of that action. But in the short term, they've been the ones that have been struggling. The ones that have been coping better, um, look, I think, you know, uh, retailers who have been attuned to what customer needs are during this strange period. Um, you know, my view is, um, you know, if, you, if your business model is catering not just for the uh, traditional face-to-face -face sales, but has a, a good business model for both the, um, the virtual um, customer experience as well as the physical customer experience, then you're going to be well equipped um, because increasingly, People are looking for the contactless shopping experience. Um, but look, uh, you know, if you look at some of the essential services, so uh, health, um, education, and, um, and, and also some of the, the essential retailing, uh, it's continued to be pretty strong. And again, there's been good government stimulus to encourage people to be able to spend. And um, so as long as you've got a business that's um, customer friendly and attuned to these changing uh, customer preferences, then, um, then you're going to have the opportunity there. Excellent. Thank you, David. Um, any other questions? That I'll ask, come? if I may, David, um, great presentation. Um, just a question in regards to some of this COVID-19 legislation that's come in, in particular, I know we've got to sympathise, empathise with employers, but Geez, I empathise with employees, especially those that have had long, you know, years of service, you know, 15, 20 years service, and all of a sudden, an employer in the current climate has the ability to make redundant employees that have had 20, 30 years and under the legislation don't have to pay out more than five weeks in terms of any redundancy payment. So it's a it's a really good point. We, you know, I talked about nine hundred thousand Australians around um, uh, or, or nationally nine hundred thousand uh, increase in unemployment. So it's nine hundred thousand people that have lost their jobs. So how have they been treated uh, treated through that process? And and 
all the more need for the industrial relations reform that um, that the government has already hinted that they're embarking on. Uh, I mean, structural reforms have got to be a great opportunity here, uh, not not just in industrial relations, but in addressing skills gaps and education and healthcare and so on. Um, but you know, specifically to your point around redundancies, uh, I suppose that that comes back to the individual um, arrangements with your employer. Um, but I, you know, I, I understand that the government is looking to uh, both address the short term challenges around industrial relations and also have some longer term aspirations. So, and I think some of the examples you're talking about there will probably come under the latter rather than the former. Um, so look, I mean, I can't sugarcoat the fact that there've been a lot of people that have lost their job. But for mine, the question is, well, how quickly can we get people yeah. re-employed? Yeah, thanks. Thank you, David. Um, can I just say, as far as uh, a lot of the reports I've, I've heard from the various banks in the last three or four months, this one seems to be the most balanced and uh, dare I say, most positive. I think you've acknowledged that, uh, you've acknowledged the things that have happened, particularly in terms of unemployment and debt and things like that. But uh, I love the fact, two things that you said. One, that it's probably short term, this particular cycle. Uh, it's not long term. Um, um, and secondly, that, um, you know, uh, I think we've got an opportunity to sort of get out of this by sort of, um, you know, um, getting back to business, if you like, um, and that the world's not going to crash all around us. So I think they, they're positive things to take out of your presentation. So um, um, that that is very, very encouraging from my point of view. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, because uh, most of the predictions that... Um, have come across from the banks and the other industries uh, or the other experts and economists since March have uh, fortunately for Australia not come through. Uh, so a lot of the negative uh, uh, predictions. So it's encouraging to see that this is quite a balanced uh, uh, look at our, our situation from a realistic point of view. So that's very good. Uh, uh, I, I thank you for that. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Yeah. Now, um, Ivan, um, do you want to talk to us uh, from a finance point of view at street level and see what your thoughts are? Very much at, um, at street level, as you put it, uh, in the coal face. Uh, what I'm encountering dealing with um, the majors, um, non-banks and um, what we call private equity. Um, in the current climate, if we're talking about developers and we're talking about you know rebuilding the economy and relying on infrastructure supporting developers supporting projects creating jobs that's what it's really all all about in the current climate these are tough times i don't have to repeat unprecedented um small business is doing it tough um so with with that in mind if we take the poor old developer who's out there trying to build a project and um, you know raise some funding to construct project Yes, we look at debt equity levels, but at the moment, the majors are all saying, uh, in terms of construction funding, we need the developer needs to generate 100 to 120 percent in net uh, debt cover, and on a you know 55 unit development, that could mean having to sell 32 apartments off the plan. And in the current climate, people are not buying off the plan, um, so it makes it very very difficult. Uh, and the majors are not coming to the party in that respect. It's just making it too hard. Uh, the larger development groups, of course, who have established relationships, uh, they're still getting a slice of the action on, on you know, more concessional terms. Um, we spoke about uh, jobs earlier in David's presentation and um, where that comes into play with developers, in particular larger developers, uh, with you know, 400, 700 unit towers is we talk about settlement risk, the ability of the buyer to complete the purchase if he's still got a job. Um, if he's still got a job, the bank still says, quite rightly, in 15 months, two years when the project's finished, we're going to have to value it at that point in time. The market's dropped. So the valuations that are being achieved today uh, reflect 
a higher LVR position, loan valuation ratio, which means the, the poor old buyer has to put his hand in his pocket and put some more deposit money in. And not all of them can afford to do that. And in some cases, where it's just too much more money, they're walking away and foregoing their deposit. That's what we call settlement risk. So that's it's another issue that developers are encountering in the marketplace. If we talk about turnaround service levels within the majors, and I'm talking about commercial lending, business lending, um, there's a major issue in, in, in the market in terms of all four major banks. The service levels for business lending is just unacceptable. You know, I have a number of instances, I have other brokers. We work under uh, an aggregator umbrella group where we have thousands of brokers reporting into the aggregator uh, who is collecting information in this respect and broaching this with, with the banks at a more senior level. Business uh, as never before needs to have funding sooner than later in today's climate. Uh, it's a very important issue. These loan applications getting bogged down, credit executive are being too tough, um, and, and the bank's debt servicing requirements are very tough on the commercial business investment side. I know for home loan lenders that, you know, all the red, red tape, bureaucracy, the Royal Commission, uh, God only knows. I mean, yes, I could put a home loan together, but I choose not to. Um, it's just too hard, you know, just too hard. But uh, Small business is, is the backbone of this country and it's something that we all need to support, in particular the banks. The majors are, are not performing in that respect. The non-banks are doing a great job. Um, and um, that's just some honest feedback at street level in terms of what, what's happening out there right now. The other um, good news story over the last couple of weeks, uh, within the last two weeks, is the abolition of stamp duty for first home buyers for purchases up to $800,000. Um, just big tick, great work. That should really get, get the ball rolling and hopefully generate some more pre-sales for these developers who are struggling to get their projects up and running. Um, in terms of general um, business uh, asset finance, leasing rates, uh, the incentives been extended as we may or may not know to December this year. Uh, so if you're purchasing an asset up to $150,000, yes, I qualify, have, have a word to your accountant and make sure that equipment uh, meets the guidelines for the full asset write-off uh, and you'll be able to write it off in the new financial year, which ends in June next year, but you've got to make the purchase by December. I, I think it's the 20th, by the 20th of December this year. So very good incentives there for business going forward. Um, and uh, what else do I want to say? We spoke about property. Uh, you know, I'm reading editorials and I'm getting feedback from our local agents in, in Epping, Ride, Marsville, Eastwood. Um, a research analyst, Dr. Nicola Powell, said it best in the new domain house price report. The outlook for the housing market is definitely more stable than the broader economy, she said. While prices in most capital cities have declined, the falls have been minimal to date. Sydney houses fell just 2% for the June quarter and only 0.9% in July. And we're finding that um, the housing market generally is still performing well locally. Uh, prestige housing, there's a shortfall and otherwise uh, attracting very good prices in the, in the local area. So it's a good news story for now and in, in the term that we've been in, but the outlook going forward is, is a huge question mark over the next 18 to 24 months. Ivan got really that much more to say, but... Um, oh, well, thank you, Ivan. Uh, before I give a, if you like, a real estate report, um, are there any questions of Ivan? Oh, and I should add, Tony, the, the government's 50% uh, guarantee on business lending to assist small business has been extended for another three months by most lenders. So it was due to uh, expire end of September. So right. the deferment of interest for a further three months has been extended to uh, continue to assist those businesses going forward. Right. Especially, yeah. 
Tony, um, can I just put a question in there? I was just wondering about, um, given we're having a reduction in immigration at the moment, what do you think, how do you think that's going to impact on the market? I mean, I, I know you're more in the business area, but do you have an opinion on the, the residential um, situation with that? Look, I think you're right, Jeff. Um, a reduction in immigration does reflect in, um, in property, properties being purchased, prop, um, you know, in the secondary market and, and off the plan in terms of new housing. Uh, definitely an impact. I could probably add to that, Jeff, that... Um, in the in uh, the the impact from uh, the migration sector has already been felt in the market pr prior to COVID nineteen, so I think the current impact is uh, is not as uh, strong as what it would have been had we not have already had the falls that we had in the last two years. Um, so um, can I perhaps because I think the what Ivan talks about and what I'll talk about, they probably interrelate a little bit. So can I just share from a real estate perspective, taking into account what David has told us at a, at a global and national level and uh, some of the comments that Ivan's made, can I just say that the real estate market, and, I'm, and I'll break it down, I'll talk about the residential market and then I'll talk about uh, the commercial, which is office space and retail market, um, can I say that the residential market has been very, very resilient through all of this. Uh, apart from March and April, where the turnovers um, obviously slowed down uh, quite substantially because everything was in uh, lockdown or potential lockdown, um, whilst the turnovers slowed down, the prices really didn't move much. They didn't go up, but they certainly didn't go down. And as... Uh, Ivan said and others have commented, the prices have been quite resilient. And I think the reason for that is if you look at real estate cycles, the real estate cycle peaked in July, 2017, and we were effectively in free fall for a couple of years. And then in about August of last year, after we had in New South Wales, a state election in March and then the federal election in May, um, Come uh, July, August, the real estate market started to rebound pretty well across um, most areas. And we were doing extraordinarily well and things were going back uh, and moving up again until we hit February, March when uh, the COVID impact and then it basically stopped us dead in the woods. Now, you know, despite all the predictions that the real estate market was going to crash, it hasn't, um, and there's a, probably a few reasons for that. Um, yes, um, people's employment is going to affect real estate, but um, as David has said, um, the impact in Australia of employment, while it's been quite significant, hasn't been uh, permanent, um, and a lot of uh, uh, people went back into work, particularly as uh, the... Um, uh, the cafes and restaurants reopen. A lot of business started getting back to work. And then, of course, the stimulus that the government has given everyone. Um, there's a lot of money in the economy, but it's it's sort of been held tightly because people are worried. Um, with uncertainty, people try to, uh, what we say, they pause uh, before they spend. But there's a lot of uh, pent-up demand. Um, there's not a lot of stock on the market. So basic supply and demand has kept prices really high. Um, and if you divide the real estate, the residential market between what we call the generic market, which is the ordinary houses that are for sale and units that are for sale. And then there's the off the plan stuff that Ivan was referring to. Uh, they're two different dynamics. The generic market has been very, very strong, very stable particularly in the bottom end and the top end, uh, very, very active and very strong. The middle market um, has been a little bit slower. And when you talk about the markets come back 2% or 0.9 of a percent, it's mainly in that middle market. It's not in the bottom end and it's certainly not in the top end. Yes, we agree that um, uh, with the off the plan selling, Two or three years ago, if you launched a project on the market, you're doing 30, 40 sales a month. Now, if you did two sales a month, it was a great month. 
Um, but what we're finding is that over the next two years, the cycle will go back to the way it was because very little new starts have started in the last 12, 18 months. Likewise, um, most developers have walked away from projects. Um, so there's a massive pent up demand and there's gonna be a massive shortage of stock over the next 12, 18 months. And that'll be, that'll set the scene for the cycle starting again. The biggest impact in real estate is obviously gonna be the office space market, the commercial market, because people, uh, businesses are pivoting. They're changing the way they act. And within a particular floor space, uh, these days you can only put half the amount of people within that floor space that you traditionally could put in because of social distancing and the four square meter, uh, four square meter rule. So that's gonna change the way we operate. And then uh, retail, for many, many years, retail's been suffering because any retail space where there's an online uh, alternative, it's very hard to, to lease that retail space. And most of the retail space these days is either professional services or food. Um, anything else that has a online uh, presence or competition is very hard to sort of lease. So the retail sector, the commercial sector is changing. It's going to be different as we move forward, but the residential sector, we're quite comfortable with it. Um, and just finally, the owner occupier market is a lot stronger than the investor market. And the reason for that is if a property used to get 650 a week and now is only getting 580 a week, well, then the property has got to be repriced um, uh, to reflect a lower return. Um, and that's where the investment type properties have come off the boil a little bit. But the regional areas, they're performing quite well. And the interesting reason that the regional areas are performing quite well, it's very much a, so, a social dynamic. Um, and, and that is a lot of people are saying, well, you know, the cities are unsafe, they're too dense. Maybe if we go out to the regionals, it's affordable, it's better lifestyle, uh, it's safer. Um, and that's what's making uh, the regionals quite safe. In the same vein, uh, back in 2001, when September 11 happened, I know of one case where uh, local pharmacists sold up everything and moved to Bathurst. And I said to him, why would you move to Bathurst? He said, well, who'd want to blow up Bathurst? <laughs> um, so um, it's a similar concept. Uh, people are moving to the regionals because of, uh, you know, from a social point of view of safety, affordability, and that sort of thing. Um, but we are quite confident in the real estate market that we're going to have an underpinning. And as employment gets back up to speed and um, people are back in work and people have pivoted and, and new industries crop up, I think there's going to be a massive multiplier in the economy and that's going to sustain uh, prices in the real estate market. Because as I say, when people say, oh, aren't you gonna crash? Uh, isn't real estate gonna crash? Well, real estate actually did crash after uh, July, 2017. So we're way off the boil. The peak was July, 2017. And we were actually on our way back up, uh, uh, up until February, March of this year, uh, when we hit the pause button because of COVID. So, um, that's my take on real estate and um, I'm quietly confident about us all moving forward as long as we're all doing the right things um, and as long as I mentioned to David the banks keep lending and keep supporting us so far the government's been doing all the right things um, it's now up to us to follow through in our respective businesses now are there any uh, questions or comments or Anything that anyone would like to pose to uh, either Ivan, David, myself, uh, happy to take any questions. I know Soraya has asked a question earlier about, um, um, uh, let me just see. Uh, Soraya asked if I 
Do you think the government will open the door to skilled migrants in the near future? If not, when do you think this will happen? Soraya, that's really a COVID safety type question. And um, uh, we're hoping and praying that the borders all open both ways, um, you know, sooner rather than later, because, um, you know, if we do get back to business, we're going to need as much skilled labour as possible. So I'm thinking the sooner the better, but it's all uh, revolves around, um, um, you know, um, you know, safety issues. I would, I would think more than anything else. Um, now, some other questions that have come through. Nigel had a good question, Tony. Is there any prospect of doing social housing like the feds do with the defence housing, and that's aimed to David or yourself? Well, the one thing that's uh, prominent now, if you notice, there's um, there's a couple of new schemes that are coming into the industry. There's the new build to rent type scenario. Um, so a lot of the developers are building projects exclusively to rent, rent out. And what they're doing, they're following a business model that's uh, prominent in Europe because most of our tenants, if you like, are fall into one of two categories categories. There are what we call transitional tenants who are renting short term um, with a view of uh, eventually purchasing. And then there's the long term tenants who, you know, are happy to, to rent forever. Um, these build to rent schemes um, are designed for those sorts of tenants who are happy to rent for, you know, five years and beyond. Um, and governments are now introducing tax incentives to allow developers to build these projects. And I know two or three projects that are currently being built around a build to rent scheme. The closest one to us at the moment is Mervac built one in Homebush Bay. The other thing is, um, if you notice the Ivanhoe estate up at Macquarie Park, North Ride, opposite the range, out of 2,700 odd dwellings, there's about, about 500 dwellings that are, are committed to social uh, housing. Um, and then there's, the, there's another three or 400 from memory that are committed to uh, affordable uh, housing. And, and the affordable is different from social. Affordable is uh, dwellings directly uh, designed for our essential services, our doctors, our nurses, our Inquiries, our um, you know police officers and the like. So there's a lot of that sort of product being built and developed both locally and across Sydney and the state. Now, um, also Nigel had uh, the same question for David. Is there any prospect of doing social housing like the feds do with defence housing? So David, would you have yeah. a response? And so similar to, to Tony's comments there, um, you know, there, there are various projects already underway. Um, but I think the opportunity for the government to um, make an additional commitment to, to social housing, you, you know, if we see the situation, say, in three months' time, if the recovery is really languishing, if we're not seeing the follow-through, maybe because there have been further lockdowns elsewhere, not just in, in Melbourne, uh, and therefore the government needs to do more in terms of fiscal policy, rather than just job seeker, job keeper and, and so on, then I think it's quite likely that they'll look at some stimulus through, uh, through social housing. Uh, so I, th I think it's a great option. Uh, it both meets the sort of um, stimulatory aspect that you need to help the economy and achieves a great social outcome. Um, but as for exactly what, what shape that takes or what, what um, how that's structured, I think that'll just depend on, um, you know, the economic circumstances and how much additional stimulus they're looking to provide. Um, do we have any, thank you, David. Um, any other comments? Uh, is, um, can, I, can I just also make a comment, if I may? Um, uh, when I was at university, um, Macquarie University, David here in the old days was known as the farm. Uh, the only real university in Sydney was Sydney University. Uh, New South Wales Uni was called Kensington High. 
and Macquarie was called the farm and I went to the farm, but I still believe it was the, the university. But uh, when I was at university in the late seventies, early eighties, um, we used to talk about lag effect and uh, with, when there's a stimulus. And in those days, the lag, uh, if there was any government stimulus, the lag would have been 12, 18 months before the impact of any fiscal policy took uh, effect. But obviously in this day and age of digital economy and whatnot, the, um, the lag is, is quite short. Um, and we've had billions of dollars injected into the economy. So um, can I get a comment from you? These, this billions of dollars that have been injected into the economy in terms of stimulus from the government and with a much shorter lag effect, can we expect almost like a big bang um, as a follow on from this COVID? And that's the thing that will sustain us moving into the future? You know, I, th I think you're spot on in terms of the, the, the lag uh, period of time that it is shorter. Um, I'm not sure I'm sufficient. I mean, I've, I've given you a, a balanced view while I'm not quite as bearish as some commentators, but but very much with a caveat that it depends on the health outcomes. So I'm not sure I'm sufficiently positive to say it's going to be a, a massive uh, snapback rebound, um, a big bang, as you, to, to use your phrase. Um, but I, I do think the fact that the stimulus has been quite well targeted will help. Um, so look at, you know, for mine, it's completely dependent on the health factors, um, how soon will we get a vaccine and therefore how quickly can we get the economy back to where it was at the start of the year and some of those factors we just don't know and therefore it, it's a bit um, ambitious to make um, uh, to make forecasts around um, mm. but I, I just I like the idea that the um, the government has uh, despite being a fiscally conservative government has embraced debt and embraced um, fiscal stimulus because they had no choice and they've been very sensible in the way they've done it. So I'm, I'm pleased to see that. And when you look at one of your graphs, uh, despite the increase in our debt compared to other countries, we're still quite low in our debt levels. When you, when you showed the graph for Japan, it's quite off the charts. <laughs> it is. I mean, we've got high levels of household debt, but, uh, but certainly from a government debt and the government's the one that's got the AAA credit rating. Uh, it's, it's very low and uh, uh, we're not going to move. A comment from a global point of view, we'd been talking through various uh, members and clients about uh, overseas investors and their impression of Australia. And we were getting comments that they're quite substantial investors and we're talking in the billions of dollars um, who are taking money out of countries like England, America and the like, and they're looking at Australia and they're targeting Australia for investment because they see Australia as generally um, uh, medically safe compared to the rest of the world and economically safe compared to the rest of the world. Um, so there's a refocus to Australia because of how well we've handled this COVID crisis relative to other countries in the world. So from a global point of view, it's actually put us on the map in a positive sense. So that's another positive that we can sort of latch onto. Oh, agreed. And that comes back to how we manage our trade partners and our international relationships. And, uh, you know, the Foreign Investment Review Board needs to get that right with getting the balance right. Uh, but we're, Australia's always been a net importer of capital, so we need to manage that effectively. Yes. All right. Um, if, thank you so much, David. Um, thank you also to Denise um, and thank you to Ivan. Thank you for everyone so, joining us. If there's We do have one more thing there, Tony. Yes. Now, um, Sean, we've tried to get is the president of Parramatta. He did want to remind you about the Wasabi Awards and oh, yes. um, it'd be really good for all our members to join in the Wasabi Awards to reflect on your small business and what you've done. And it's actually a good way to just, uh, with all that spare time you may have, you might be able to put it into a good awards. Uh, I did notice Luke McGee is on, if, uh, if you wanted to add some more parts. I personally have gone into the Wasabis and it's a great experience. So I definitely uh, recommend it to any of our businesses. 
I think you should define the Wasabi Awards. So oh, it's thank you. Uh, it's <laughs> Western can, Sydney. Uh, look, Luke here, I can add a few things for Good. sure. I'm not going on camera because I'm sitting in a dark room. The, <laughs> uh, so the, it stands for the Western Sydney Awards for Business Excellence. It's been run every year for the last 30 years. So this is the 30th year anniversary. Uh, all small businesses, Western Sydney, encouraged to submit an application around their business. There's about 15 or 16 categories from um, manufacturing to professional services to um, up and coming young business people. So have a bit of a look. It's, it's a big awards night, it's been held the last couple of years at Rose Hill Race Course. They've had five, 600 people. It's a fantastic event. And you get a lot of exposure for your business as a uh, one, if you enter, and two, especially if you win. So we just encourage anybody who uh, wants to have a crack at it. The website is wasabi.com.au. Um, Andrew might like to share it around again. I know Riverside have sent out a few emails about it in the past, but we'd just yes. like to, yeah. Luke, um, Ivan Radovnikovic, I have started. Um, I started a couple of weeks ago. I know the window's only open for another two weeks. So I'm, I'm about halfway through, but I, I do expect to complete it and submit it. So, Excellent. Good work. Yeah, entries are meant to shut, yeah, the um, 17th of August. So, and the awards night is the uh, 20th of November. So, and subject to, you know, COVID and everything, it's, we're still just, we'll monitor that situation. All Thanks, right. Luke. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and just finally, um, through Andrew Hill, um, uh, Andrew, uh, you may or may not be aware that uh, we're coming up to the 20 year anniversary of the Sydney Olympic Games. Um, and Andrew has in his possession, the Olympic torch. Um, and subject to his time, uh, he's happy to come to your business to do a photo shoot with the Olympic torch. And then you can obviously use that uh, to promote your business. Uh, if you're a member of uh, uh, the business chamber, I know he's coming to our office and all the team are gonna be um, so standing around um, Andrew as if, as if he's a gold medalist mm -hmm. with the torch and we're going to be doing a photo shoot and i would encourage subject to andrew's time to take advantage of this opportunity because it's only the 20 year anniversary of the sydney olympics ons so let's take advantage of it when when's the actual it's the 16th of uh, september is that right andrew uh yeah the 15th tuesday the 15th of september is 20 years since um kathy freeman and i've been told that she'll be lighting the cauldron on that day and and I will keep you up to date and love to see people out there because you'll uh, have all your memories. Positive, positive Brilliant. thoughts, yeah. Brilliant, so if, for those of you who want to reach out to Andrew, please take advantage of this once in a, a you know, lifetime, I suppose, situation yeah. um, and, um, you know, uh, take a photo shoot and leverage that uh, photo shoot as uh, uh, to promote your business uh, with uh, clients and the like. Um, and um, I, I think on that basis, if there's no one else who has any other comments, I'd like to thank you all. Uh, Luke, thank you in the chat. You've just given us the website for Wasabi. Thank you for that. Uh, and I noticed Nigel, you're sponsoring uh, the manufacturing award. That's brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, so I think we've also already got some participation from our members in Wasabi and I would encourage you to participate in that because it's all part of um, uh, growing our business and networking. Um, a very big and final thank you to Denise Kelly and David Robertson for sharing your time with us. We really appreciate uh, not only sharing your time with us, but all the insights. And Denise, you know that we're going to be there supporting you as you establish the Eastwood branch of uh, the Bendigo Community Bank. So uh, thank you all, one and all. Um, uh, Andrew will be in contact with all our members for our September meeting. Uh, we're looking to have several meetings in September. One with Venture Cafe. And for those of you who are involved in technology, um, we're looking to do something with the Venture Cafe 
uh, around how digital technology will deliver the next step change in business. Uh, we're also looking to run a session uh, with all our members where we want to showcase uh, a lot of our members. And through our board member, Sabrina, in October, October is Wellness Month, and um, we're looking to have a strategy around health and well-being. And Sabrina will be um, sort of contacting everyone uh, around that concept um, for October. So we're going to leverage the... Uh, um, Sabrina, are you there? What's it actually called in, uh, in October? Not there. All right. Okay, well, um, I think on that basis, we'll say good night and stay well and stay safe and look forward to seeing you all again uh, next month. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. See ya. Hey, well done, Tony. Thank you. Well done, Tony. Right. Well, well done, Andrew. Well, no, thanks, Ivan. Thank you all. Uh, no doubt we'll talk in the next few days as a follow on. So, yeah. all of you take care and stay safe. Can you all send right. me your video as well and I'll fix everything from there? Yep, I'll get Kira to send it in the morning. Thank you. All right. All right. Good night, thanks, all. Johnny. Bye bye. Bye.